Good morning to the Finance Income and Summit and welcome to EDFI's high-level event dedicated to private sector financing in Africa. My name is Bruno Wen. I'm chairman of the European Development Finance Institute and I'll be your host this morning. EDFI represents 15 development finance institutions based in Europe. Development finance institutions are majority owned by national states and invest in private project, sector projects in low and middle income countries to promote job creation and sustainable economic growth. Thank you for joining us in one of the first events of the Finance and Common Summit. Africa is a continent with a very young and growing population, a population that needs jobs. Jobs are being created by the private sector only. This is a short narrative why the private sector is key for the development in Africa. Within the private sector, it is a micro, small and medium-sized enterprise that employ by far the majority of the people and they generate by far the majority of jobs. <clears throat> and even more, SMEs contribute uh, up to 40% of national income in developing countries, according to the World Bank. This is why creating, promoting and financing these businesses are critically important for the development of Africa. They need the environment that helps to create new enterprises, they need training to scale up, and they need access to sustainable finance. The situation today is that there are large weaknesses in the business environment and that the funding gap is huge. <clears throat> COVID-19 has reinforced these bottlenecks with the devastating impact on the private sector in Africa. The progress of the last decade has stalled at best and wiped out at worst. The prospects of me, micro, small and medium-sized enterprises under, are under acute pressure and efforts to expand inclusive financial solutions are an important part <clears throat> of the crisis response. With one third of their 46 billion euros portfolio invested in private enterprises in Sub-Saharan Africa, European Development Finance Institutes are committed to actively contribute to recovery in Africa. Since March, we have intensified our collaboration across DFIs and with multilateral development banks to better coordinate our response to the challenges faced by the private sector in Africa. On the occasion of this high-level event, I'm very pleased to launch a coalition of 20 public development banks for sustainable and inclusive recovery of the private sector involving the African Development Bank, the West African Development Bank, WAD, the Development Finance Institute, Canada, FINDEF, Canada, represented today in the audience by Mr. Vincent Klaassen, Minister Councillor at the Embassy of Canada to France, US Development Finance Corporation, the Islamic Corporation for the Development of the Private Sector, IDC, and of course, the 15 members of IDF, I, EDFI, the Association of European Development Finance Institutes. With our collective portfolio of nearly 90 billion US dollars committed to private sector operations in low and middle income countries, supporting more than 12 million jobs, with over 40% of this in Africa, we commit. We will deepen cooperation among our institutions. We will focus on inclusive financial solutions for the private sector. We will support clients with technical assistance and advisory solutions when needed. We join a coalition. Uh, we join a challenge to dedicate at least 4 billion US dollars for African micro, small and medium-sized enterprises by the end of 2021. And we call on other development finance institutions to join us in our collective action uh, <clears throat> to help micro and small and medium-sized enterprises in Africa. In our discussion this morning, we will explore two main issues, namely what are the financial needs of the private sector and especially the micro, small and medium-sized enterprises during the current crisis and beyond, and what needs to be done to build back better, what can be done to improve the economic environment, build investment readiness and attract more private investments in Africa. I'm very pleased with um, a distinguished panel of free experts and you have seen it already on the slide. Ifi, she is the CEO of the Tony Elomelo Foundation. Uh, the, the Tony Elomelo 
Ilomelo Foundation helps to create new businesses by providing training to 3,000 plus students all over Africa and provide seed capital for starting an enterprise. Many thanks, Ivy, for joining us today. We are very interested to learn from your experiences and your suggestions on the way forward. And second, we have Diana, the CEO of the Bank of Kigali. Bank of Kigali is one of the many banks that provides loans to micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. Many thanks, Diana, also for joining us this morning. We are very eager to listen to you and to your insights, um, how you see the challenges with SME finance and your ideas to close the finance gap. And finally, we have Kola with us, the managing director and co-founder of Babangona. Babangona is an agricultural social enterprise that provides key services to small older farmers that result in significant increases in productivity. And by doing that, SMEs improves their businesses and at the same time reducing the risk for the banks so that there is an incentive for banks to lend to agricultural SMEs. Many thanks, Kola, also for joining us today. We are very much looking forward to get your insights in the bottlenecks, but also in the opportunities. And in addition, we will benefit from the insights of free video interventions. We have asked two major investors in Africa how local and international financing solutions can contribute to the recovery. Let's hear the views of uh, Mr. Assis Mebarak, the founding partner and co-founder of Africa Invest. Africa Invest is among the most experienced private equity investors in Northern and Sub-Saharan Africa, with eight offices across the continent. He is also a long-term partner and client of European DFIs. Please start the video. the opportunity to address this distinguished audience. Many African MSMEs are suffering during these challenging COVID days. Certain sectors have been more adversely impacted than others, such as hospitality, financial services, commodity-linked industries, and certain types of FMCG companies. There are also opportunities for investment that have opened up in the face of consolidation, as well as promoting regional development. Supporting operational efficiencies through technology enhancements may help African MSMEs outperform in sectors such as EduTech, which can also be an appropriate answer to the brain drain currently bleeding the continent, as well as healthcare, where there is an urgent need for the continent to catch up. Moreover, supply chain and logistics transformation can contribute to promoting intra-Africa trade. DFIs can structure their assistance to both address these challenges and take advantage of the opportunities. Here are four suggestions on how they can do this. 1. Set up short-term relief facilities designed in a way which allows to reach the needed quick funds disbursement. 2. Reinforce local banks, microfinance institutions and private debt structures, especially through equity, tier 2 contribution and long-term local currency debt. Promoting alternative fintech companies using a combination of microfinance and technology could help increase efficiency and scalability. Three, support PPP strategies with a focus on green energy and infrastructure projects through empowering more GPs in this segment. This is relevant now in light of many governments' budget constraints. Four, reinforce the equity offer as well as technical assistance in both PE and VC by further supporting existing GPs and empowering new fund managers. Attracting private investors into African funds through the so-called blended finance structures with favorable terms for commercial investors could make a real difference as could advocacy and training to local pension fund managers to attract part of their investment to this asset class. I believe that with innovative and open approaches, there is much room for success. Thank you. Very great, uh, with four very concrete suggestions. Uh, Short-term relief facilities, reinforce local banks and microfinance institutions, uh, promote uh, very much PPPs, uh, especially uh, for green energy and the infrastructure. And the fourth suggestion of uh, <coughs> ASIS was to reinforce uh, equity and TA technical assistance for funds. So let's hear now 
the views of a key multilateral actor, the International Finance Corporation, Mr. Sergio Pimenta, the Vice President of the Middle East and Africa, will offer his insight on how to respond to the needs of the private sector in Africa, especially the smaller businesses, and more especially, especially what could be done to improve investment readiness and public governance. Please start the video. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sergio Pimenta, and I'm IFC Vice President for the Middle East and Africa. I'd like to welcome you all to the Finance and Cotton Summit and would like to extend a thank you to EDFI for inviting IFC to participate. The question to be answered during today's session is what can be done to improve investment readiness and public governance for MSMEs in Africa? Let me share a few thoughts. Micro, small and medium enterprises, or MSMEs, account for 90% of all businesses in Sub-Saharan Africa. They are critical to maintaining jobs and incomes, and they drive economic growth across the region. In Nigeria, MSMEs account for 50% of GDP and employ 86% of the national workforce. Despite their importance, MSMEs struggle to secure financing. They force to deal with weak transport and energy infrastructure in many countries, and they often last to benefit from inadequate business climate regulations. So what can we do to help? At IFC, we are working together with the World Bank through policy reforms at the country and sector level to address the regulatory bottlenecks to doing business. We are working upstream to create, deepen and expand markets by designing and implementing projects in targeted sectors that we believe can attract private investment. This year, about 22% of our operating budget will be designated for these upstream activities. IFC is also providing non-financial services to help unlock the growth potential of MSMEs, including those owned by women. For example, in Kenya, we supported a local bank to design and deliver tailored business training and coaching to over 800 SMEs, of which 58% were women-owned. The support is helping entrepreneurs expand their business. Those are some of the actions IFC is taking to support MSMEs across Africa. I wish you all a fruitful discussion and look forward to hearing the actions that you and other DFIs are taking. So Sergio has um, highlighted uh, three issues. The one is <clears throat> to work on policy reforms on the global and <clears throat> sectoral level and to address regulatory bottlenecks uh, and IFC is doing that with the World Bank. And then also the need to, to deepen and expand markets uh, through upstreaming activities and then providing non-financial finance. We will now start our debate and uh, we the first uh, what I like to hear from the panelists is their reaction on what we heard from Assis and uh, his suggestions and I would like to start with you Ivy. Um, you work with entrepreneurs every day. Is the picture that uh, that he was uh, highlighting accurate? And what do you see are the main challenges entrepreneurs face today and uh, how to deal with the uncertainty which is uh, aggravated by the present uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis? I think the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bruno. And thank you for um, having me as part of this discourse. Uh, uh, as you know, I'm not going to go into what we do, but the heart of what we do is about empowering entrepreneurs and giving them what they need to succeed. And it's what I like to call the two C's. You know, the first is capacity building and the second is capital. And these are the two critical things that MSMEs ar across Africa need. We have a, a, a tried and tested model uh, the largest entrepreneur, the largest private sector-led entrepreneurship program on the African continent. We have trained, mentored, and funded entre thousands of entrepreneurs across all 54 African countries. So we have our finger on the pulse. We we speak to entrepreneurs and we know the challenges they face. And um, I also 
spend uh, the two speakers and, and, and the videos they shared, because definitely the DFIs and the multilaterals are vested in the success of MSMEs across Africa, because with Africa's burgeoning youth population, uh, some studies say that by the turn of the century, uh, one in four people in the world will be African. So this is the time to do the work to ensure that uh, they are positively engaged, earning income and have spending capacity. Otherwise, the, the, the world economy might just implode. So what we're looking at now is what, from our perspective, from what we've seen on the ground in our experience, do MSMEs need? And the one critical thing is capital. You know, I, I'm, I'm having, for me, this is a very frank and open conversation because like I said, it's very laudable, uh, the amount of money that uh, the DFIs have spent, particularly the, the European DFIs, you know. Um, some studies state that over the last 10 years, over 36 billion has been spent in Africa alone. And we should see, good return on investment from that, from that uh, 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 capital expenditure. But what we have found on the ground is that entrepreneurs need to be trusted. We need to put money in the hands of the entrepreneurs. Yes, policy reforms is critical. Governments, African governments across board need to understand that they must create an enabling environment. And that is absolutely imperative. Uh, we, through advocacy, work hand in hand with African governments to ensure that the enabling environment is created. And just as uh, 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 the VP of IFC stated that, you know, policy reform, you know, cleaning out regulatory bottlenecks is part of the work that, that, the, that the DFIs and multilateral absolutely have to do. But that is on the one hand. Um, you know, uh, as, as I listened to the, 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 the intervention and the stream of activities, I heard upstream activities, deepening and expanding markets. I had non-financial services. And there seems to be a, um, uh, an aversion to actually putting money in the hands of entrepreneurs. Like we don't trust these entrepreneurs. But at the end of the day, they are the ones creating the jobs. We see that 80 to 90% of the jobs on the African continent is created by the MSMEs. So if anyone needs financial intervention, they do. And of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that Africa is the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the MSMEs do not have the shock absorbers that the bigger companies have, who have who, as well as the governments. And all the, um, all the relief and, and recovery measures that are being put in place is not trickling down to the MSMEs, and that is what we see. So we have understood as well that the structure of the, the you know, financial sector, you know, it, it almost cuts off these MSMEs. Because by the time you look at banks, they are looking to fund viable uh, uh, businesses that are already structured and have track record. Same thing with private equity firms. So what do we do with, you know, entrepreneurs who are still starting their journey, who are, you know, still, you know, close to the bottom of the pyramid? That is where interventions like what we have at the Tony and Miller Foundation come in. You know, a lot of the DFIs also cannot engage with entrepreneurs at that level one-on-one. -on -one. You know, if it's not uh, $10, 20000000 million deals, it doesn't make financial sense. And that's understandable. You know, of course, the risk has to be mitigated as well. So the, the tried and tested model that we are using at the foundation is that we say that at the bottom of the pyramid, nobody's playing at the bottom of the pyramid. And we need to ensure that we are creating more entrepreneurs and pushing them up, up, up the pyramid where they can now become more attractive to the banks or the private equity firms. But if we do not focus on the bottom of the pyramid, we find that we keep recycling the same entrepreneurs and we don't see as much growth uh, uh, commentary to the amount of investment being put into the African continent. So once again, like I said, I, I, I applaud the DFIs and the multilaterals and all the great work that's being done. But I think in order for us to really see the impact, in order for us to really empower the MSMEs, we have to trust, we have to uh, uh, work with a tried and tested model. So an, an entrepreneurship program like ours, we have uh, ability to reach thousands, if not millions, of African entrepreneurs across the entire continent. We have spent millions setting up a platform, tfconnect.com, to ensure that entrepreneurs are screened, they are trained, they are mentored, and then they are tested to determine their readiness to receive seed capital funding. 
Once they've received the seed capital funding, we go on to continue to track their progress. We have a very rigorous monitoring and evaluation program that ensures that we track their progress and, and able to measure how many jobs they're creating, uh, what sort of revenues they're generating, what impact are they having on their communities, and most importantly, which of the sustainable development goals are they meeting. And all of our entrepreneurs, we're happy to say, typically meet between one and three of the sustainable development goals. And with that, we now find that two, three years into their entrepreneurial journey, most of our entrepreneurs, at the very minimum, are hiring five people. They're creating employment for five people. But we have entrepreneurs who are creating employment for hundreds uh, of, of, of people within their community, both direct and indirect jobs. At that stage, we're now able to present them to banks for debt financing or other angel investors who are looking to do uh, uh, equity financing. And so for us, it is critical to, to, to look at it from the top, from, you know, not a, to have a bottom up approach and to ensure that we're seeing entrepreneurs across Africa from startup to IPO. We must continue along the value chain and not only focus on mid-level uh, uh, or mid-growth entrepreneurs. So for us in the foundation, it is, um, it is very important and uh, this sort of platform uh, is extremely critical because we see the potential. Uh, we also very much applaud the 3 billion uh, euros that the European DFIs have put together as a uh, post-COVID recovery fund for Africa. But what we implore is let us not focus only on those who are already uh, 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 ready or, or you know, turning over millions of dollars. Let us ensure that it trickles down to those who really need it. You know, we found that the World Bank forecasts that the African continent for the first time in a century is going to experience a recession. Some reports uh, project a 3% GDP contraction. And the impact on jobs will be huge. McKinsey actually estimates uh, that we will lose between 9 to 18 million formal jobs. And 100 million informal jobs will lose income, will be vulnerable to the loss of income. And of this 100 million informal jobs, 75% of them are women. And so we must act quickly, we must act now, and we must ensure that the intervention trickles down to those who need it the most and use a tried and tested model to ensure that the, the true MSMEs, uh, uh, who are the, the primary job producers and job creators on the African continent, have the support that they need to weather the storm through this COVID period. Thank you. So many thanks, uh, Ivy, also for this uh, very encouraging plea uh, putting money in the hands of entrepreneurs and uh, having a systematic and holistic approach from startups uh, to IPOs. And uh, this is why I would like uh, to ask uh, Diana, <clears throat> Diana, how do you see it as, uh, as a CEO of the Bank of Kigali? Yeah? Um, putting man money in the hands of entrepreneurs, that's exactly what banks are should do. And um, what... Uh, is needed for you to to expand uh, the services, the, fin the access uh, to finance for small and medium-sized enterprises, and what do you need in order also to care for the startups, and and how you can also collaborate much more with um, uh, what uh, Ivy was mentioning that uh, institutions like the Tune Ilomelo Foundation creates or provides you with the next generation of clients, um, successful startup companies. So Diana, the thank floor you. Will thank you very much, Bruno, and, and thank you for having me uh, in this summit. Um, I'm learning a lot and getting to know uh, new people, so it, it's uh, very exciting in these uh, challenging times of, of COVID-19. So obviously, banks are meant to put money in, in the hands of, of the entrepreneurs. This is our mandate, is to finance the economy, and to finance the private sector. So, so this is exactly uh, what we do uh, for a living. And, um, and we've been doing that quite successfully over the years. Um, and we are riding obviously on the back of a strong foundation uh, in terms of um, uh, supportive doing business environment, uh, supportive regulatory um, environment uh, that allows us to do uh, business and to uh, continue to grow the economy. Now, these, these times have been challenging for everyone, uh, of course, for the bank, but mainly for our clients who are there to offer jobs, uh, to create value for, for, for the economy. 
And uh, what we've been doing uh, with them, I think with the support of, of the government, uh, the government set up what they called uh, an economic recovery fund. Um, and not only to, again, put money in the hands of these entrepreneurs, as uh, Ife is saying, but also safeguard jobs. Um, so the way this um, uh, fund was structured, we had a window for refinancing because we have many businesses, including in particular in the, the hospitality industry, that you know are affected by the pandemic. Uh, there's no no conference, no tourists uh, coming to Rwanda, and we've been able to refinance all our clients a portion of, of their facilities with banks. Uh, I think it was a maximum 35 percent into longer term and um, low cost uh, finance, and this acts as uh, deleveraging these companies and uh, reducing the interest burden or the um, uh, interest capitalization that is happening uh, during this period where they cannot service the facilities. So this has been very much welcome and uh, the fund that was set up by the government was uh, about $50 million has been used up and there's actually need for more. The second window uh, was um, a working capital window uh, which is being deployed right now by all banks, uh, including Bank of Kigali uh, as the largest commercial bank. Uh, we, we play a bigger role there. And this is actually, you know, again, to put money, at this time it's not refinancing, it's to put money into the hands of these entrepreneurs at low cost for them to continue providing these jobs, for them to, you know, keep the lights on, uh, as we say here during these uh, challenging times. And this, we can see now economy uh, picking up slowly, uh, we see, you know, business picking up in markets, in uh, busy areas, you see life uh, coming back. And this is, uh, again, because of the support that uh, banks have been giving. And, and finally, there's the, 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 um, the last window, which is uh, an MSME window, mainly um, uh, channeled through uh, microfinance institutions. And this, again, is to support uh, micro businesses with uh, very small funding to, to make sure, again, they, they, keep, uh, they keep the lights on. So this has been quite um, uh, uh, useful and, you know, we are hoping, uh, looking at uh, the, the transactions we see, looking at, um, uh, you know, the, the, how the way the economy is picking up, we are hoping to close the year with a positive uh, growth rate. Now, as Ife is saying, uh, the challenges for us um, as, as a bank, um, we finance mainly, you know, established SMEs. If I look at my portfolio, uh, top 100, uh, these are basically uh, established companies in uh, various sectors of the economy. You know, I, I have in my book, you know, uh, manufacturing plants, we uh, financed uh, cement plants, agro-processing plants. We finance, obviously, hotels, etc. So we have established companies. And what um, the, 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 the challenge I see is um, sometimes in the management of these companies, you see uh, very successful entrepreneurs that are probably, you know, reaching 60, 70. And uh, the management of, of the corporate governance of these companies, you know, leaves a lot to, to desire. And we keep engaging uh, these entrepreneurs, telling them, you know, you need to plan for the future. We want to see you having a strong management, a strong board, a strong, strong corporate governance, because we project your growth in the next 10 years or 20 years. And, and probably, you know, you will not be there. And uh, we have, and, and this is what my, my credit risk colleague, uh, colleagues tell me every day, we see a key man risk in many businesses. And we, 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 we are you know, looking for partnerships with uh, the likes of uh, the, the Tony Elumelu Foundation or other business development uh, companies to support the development of corporate governance in, in these you know, quite successful companies, just to plan for, um, you know, to ensure sustainability, to make sure these uh, businesses will survive another 10 or 20 years. And we keep telling them that, you know, only if they have the right uh, corporate governance, they'll be able to access funding through uh, capital markets. Uh, they'll be able to, you know, actually even uh, get better, cheaper funding from banks. And this is a conversation that has been happening. And, you know, I, I still see a challenge there. Now, as a bank, uh, we can only find, we, we, we are regulated, uh, uh, companies, we are channeling savings from, you know, our uh, depositors. We, we cannot, you know, do startup capital, we cannot uh, finance startups, etc. But uh, what we've been doing at Bank of Kigali uh, that uh, uh, started operations about 53 years ago as a commercial bank, we've grown into a financial services uh, company where we also offer, we have a separate business that, that offers um, uh, insurance um, 
uh, policies. We have uh, a business that is uh, now offering uh, a capital market services and they do advisory. And this, we believe, is a way for us to complement uh, each other as we support our clients. We can offer them, uh, of course, uh, bank services, insurance services, but we also want to be able to advise them to raise capital for them through other means uh, than banking. And uh, this is what we've been trying. And we are looking for more partnerships with uh, DFIs, with uh, you know, uh, people who want to plan uh, for the transformation of our economy in, in the next 20 years. So, so I believe there's still a lot to do. Uh, on the continent, we have uh, young, smart entrepreneurs with uh, brilliant ideas. But we still need to structure these ideas uh, and, and probably some, something I would want uh, us to talk about uh, in this uh, session or in this uh, summit in general is how we finance the youth in Africa, because the youth is the future for Africa. Uh, they are all connected, uh, they are positive, better educated, brilliant ideas, but we need to find the right uh, finance, uh, financing structures and, and products uh, for, for these youth uh, if we want uh, to truly transform uh, the continent. So this is my contribution to this question, and I look forward to uh, uh, more engaging questions. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks, Diana. That's um, that's highly welcome your intervention, and I like very much uh, that you that you raised the issue of corporate governance. Uh, and I share the view that corporate governance uh, is always a key issue, and this is why we within EDFI, our members, have stepped up uh, the efforts uh, since many many years, also to write. Um, uh, advisory services, uh, how how to uh, in in how to create the corporate governance uh, within uh, companies that is uh, in line with accepted uh, standards, and um, like also what you mentioned that um, that uh, that indeed there's a question how to get the right finance uh, for the very young people, and with that uh, I like uh, to call on uh, Kula because. Uh, He's doing something which, uh, which, which is very interesting, helping smallholder farmers uh, to increase their productivity. And uh, I would like uh, to ask him to, to elaborate a little bit more on what he is doing, and especially also in doing that, um, elaborate a little bit, what do you expect from the banks, from the public development banks, DFIs, in how far we can help you to expand and scale up your businesses. Kola, it's yours. Well, uh, uh, first of all, Bruno, thank you for the uh, kind invitation. Um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to begin uh, by basic probably uh, talking to uh, really the urgency to why we need to solve the, the problem that we're all here today to address. I think fundamentally, um, you know, if you look at Nigeria. Uh, from 2000, from 1990 to 2010, uh, roughly 20 million youth entered an oversaturated workforce, uh, triggering youth unemployment to, to spike to up to 60%, in turn triggering not one, not two, but three insurgencies. If you look at 2010, the year Babangona started, to 2030, the next 20 years, four times the number of youth, 80 million people, nearly the population of Germany, the world's fourth largest economy, will be entering an already oversaturated workforce. And so for us, uh, we started down this journey uh, recognizing that, uh, that the way that we think about supporting MSMEs and job creation, we had to start thinking about it very differently. And we had to start thinking about it in a way that, would, uh, that could scale and create the quantum of jobs we need as quickly as possible. And so really that was the genesis of Babangona. And really what we focused on was we recognized at the end of the day, why do MSMEs fail? MSMEs fail uh, because they struggle to access capital. They struggle to access the knowledge they need to be effective. They struggle to get the supply chains that they need to be, uh, to get the products that they need e efficiently and effectively. And they often struggle to find the markets. So what we did with Babangona is to basically create a model of financing and supporting MSMEs that is hyper-focused to ensure that you are able to ensure that you can solve all of those critical challenges that the MSME faces. In turn, creating a scenario where now you can create a highly scalable model that can support tens of thousands, eventually millions of MSMEs.
So if you look at Babangona today, uh, we are West Africa's single largest maize producing entity. Uh, we're su we've supported over uh, 130,000 uh, agricultural entrepreneurs in rural communities to date. Uh, Today, we are farming an area with our members that is uh, about 80,000 acres of maize, an area equivalent to five Manhattans. And we've created a scenario, that, a system that is exceptionally scalable. If you look at this year, despite the challenges of COVID, uh, the model we've developed was able to double in size uh, in the midst of a pandemic. Right off of the already very large base. We were a very large organization last year farming an area equivalent to about two and a half Manhattans. Now, the beauty of this types of these types of models is because they're hyper focused and very focused on solving all the different pieces that an MSE, MSME, the all different challenges that MSME faces, you're in turn able to de-risk that MSME and catalyze significant amounts of capital to that. Uh, we've been operating now, we're about to enter our 10th year of operation, uh, been able to deploy tens of millions of dollars to MSMEs and, and in the agriculture space and uh, operating at a 99% repayment rate. Now, what this in turn enables us to do is be able to catalyze in very large amounts of capital. Uh, we just, uh, back in 2018, we closed a $25 million round of financing that enabled us to scale to where we are. Today, we've now launched a $90 million round of financing uh, where we have partners like KFW that have come in on the equity side, partners like EDFI that have come in on the, on the subordinated debt side. But, and that will enable us to scale to the point where we cumulatively now we'll be able to support about 450,000 smallholder farmers in turn, uh, creating you know, nearly half a million direct jobs and in turn creating an additional half a million indirect jobs. So well over 1 million uh, jobs impact. Now, specifically to what is required to enable these types of specialized hyper growth uh, uh, models for creating jobs through MSMEs. At the end of the day, these models tend to be um, uh, require very large amounts of uh, working capital. And so, uh, and also these models tend to not, uh, they're highly impactful by their nature, but they tend to uh, also be very uh, low margin models, particularly because you're you are dealing with uh, not only in agriculture, but you're dealing with agricultural commodities that are typically um, stable commodities. We focus very much on products like uh, rice and maize. Uh, so these are relatively low margin agricultural commodities, but the benefit of that is because they're stable crops, the market is, is very large and you can scale and the impact is very large. But on the flip side, that means that the margins tend to be low, which means uh, it becomes a little bit more challenging to raise the, uh, the equity due to the economics uh, in the short term. Uh, but we feel there's very strong economics in the medium to long term. So the role for, uh, so the critical role that uh, investors in the development community play is coming in and uh, participating in subordinated and providing subordinated debt. Uh, because what that has uh, enabled us uh, with partners like EDFI that have come in and participated in subordinated debt, historically what we've seen is for every dollar we, can, we raise in subordinated debt, we're able to raise $3 in senior debt. And really that creates a, a great multiplier effect that enables these models to be highly scalable, yet ensuring that they are able to uh, remain in their core mission of creating tens of thousands, eventually hundreds of thousands, and eventually millions of jobs for, uh, for agricultural MSMEs. So many thanks, Kola. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's great that you have uh, developed a bankable uh, uh, model with such a huge impact on, on the creation of, um, of, uh, of jobs. And, uh, and I think what you highlighted is that, uh, that, uh, that there should be a readiness also from public development banks and, and EDFI to accept uh, that due to the low margin of uh, the commodities that the small, fa uh, small farmers are dealing with, there's a need also to come, out, uh, to come with a subordinated DAF, which helps them to leverage. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's very important. Let's uh, have a short round uh, of discussion on what uh, Sergio told us, uh, because uh, 
We have just discussed very much what we can do on the institution level, but uh, uh, finance in itself is not sufficient uh, to solve the issues, and we need also some kind of policy reforms, etc. So I would like also to have your views on uh, what uh, Sergio mentioned, and uh, I would like also to call on the audience that uh, in um, in uh, in the in the chat room you can. Um, you can uh, put your questions uh, that we will take up uh, in a few minutes. So may I start then with uh, Ify again. What can be done to foster entrepreneurship and business creation on the continent, uh, on the policy arena? Thank you once again, Bruno. Um, I think the, the very encouraging thing is that over the last 10 years, um, entrepreneurship, African entrepreneurship, uh, is now firmly on the global agenda, um, as well as on the agenda of, of African governments. Um, at uh, you know, every year um, to, to celebrate the, the cohort for that year, so the, the foundation uh, five years ago launched a $100 million commitment to identify, train, and fund 10,000 African entrepreneurs, but with you know the, an annual application of over 260,000 applications annually. You know, our commitment to select 1,000 a year, you know, was very insignificant, less than 1% of those who apply, just to show the sheer need uh, from African youth. And so we opened the, the, the program up to partners. You know, so uh, take last year, for instance, we were able to, to train and fund uh, over um, 5,000 entrepreneurs. Uh, and each of them, once they receive the capacity building and mentoring, and they have certified business plans certified by Deloitte, um, they receive a $5,000 non-returnable seed capital. And so at the end of every cohort, we usually have the Tony Miller Foundation Entrepreneurship Forum. And so last year, we, had, we actually had five African presidents uh, attend the forum. And for us, that was testament to the fact that African leaders, policymakers are understanding that the only way is is the only way for econ sustainable economic development is to prioritize entrepreneurship and to prioritize uh, uh, human development, particular with particular emphasis on our youth. And so, what we do is we 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 we, we leverage our networks with government, and we actually create. Uh, a situation where our entrepreneurs are able to speak directly to their governments, not just at the forum, but even beyond the forum. And we found that African governments are increasingly realizing that creating an enabling environment, having policy reform that will, that will prioritize the needs of micro and small medium enterprises in Africa is absolutely critical. I always say to our entrepreneurs that if you can succeed as an, as an entrepreneur in Africa, you can succeed anywhere. But we need to begin to help them. We need to begin to support their journey. And so it is important now for African governments to, to begin to look at tax, ta you know, as little as tax systems. You know, most of the countries or most of the states in Nigeria, for instance, have multiple taxation systems where it's almost punitive if you want to be an entrepreneur. So governments need to look at the tax system and have tax breaks for micro and small medium enterprises that are actually creating jobs and give them a cushion, especially for the first five years of their businesses. We also, of course, must address the issue of electricity because in a country like Nigeria, uh, uh, having to pay for your own electricity and generate your own electricity eats into your bottom line up to 40, 50%. And so already they're not able to be competitive with their global uh, uh, with, with, with um, other global counterparts. So, you know, when we look at things like um, electricity, uh, taxation, of course, ease of doing business, I must commend quite a number of African governments have made a lot of progress around the ease of doing business. But in addition to that, we also must begin to look at implementing the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement. Africa is a huge population. It's, it's one of the largest free trade zones with the ratification of the uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. But how do we now actualize it? How do we now implement it? You know, we must, governments must work together to break down the fragmented markets that exist in Africa. Our entrepreneurs are constantly, uh, uh, you know, complaining to us that how is it that they want to buy uh, uh, raw materials from their neighbor in Ghana and they must change their Naira to dollar first before they can send students to their, to their neighbor. 
the Green Country Department. So what can we do? Uh, and this would obviously involve the development organizations as well, like the Africa and Bank. How can we uh, uh, take down these, these, these obstacles and, and, and these boundaries? Of course, critically, if the AS ACFTA is going to work, we must have transportation lines across Africa. We, it's, it's faster for me to get to Europe or the United States than for me to get to Zambia. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, we need to create uh, um, a route, a trading route. I mean, this existed two, three hundred years ago. So why can't we ensure that it exists today? So African governments need to invest heavily in infrastructure, uh, rail lines, uh, road networks within the African continent. Because if we can create intra-African trade, the African entrepreneur will, will, will leapfrog uh, in terms of ge revenue generated and growth. So these are some of the things that African governments, I think, can work on. And of course, the development partners are critical to this because they invest in Africa. And if they can ensure that some of these policy and infrastructure interventions are a requirement to these investments, then we can begin to see real growth and real scale in, 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 in MSMEs in Africa. No, thank you very much, Afifi, also to addressing once again the responsibility of governments uh, to take care that, uh, that, uh, that there is a business environment that is then conducive for the private sector. And I'd like to take the opportunity also to mention that we as EDFI, we have So sorry, sorry again. So sorry, nope. sorry again, ladies and gentlemen, for for these technical problems. I was just mentioning that uh, we as EDFI that we have just co-published a working paper for consultation on. Uh, 
uh, on on, uh, on on the policy bottlenecks, uh, which prevents uh, much more private sector investments. And we hope very much that uh, based on these guidelines, we can then have uh, uh, a more coherent uh, uh, policy dialogue with, with the policy makers. But uh, I'd like uh, to, 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 to ask um, Diana, what do you expect from the central banks, from your government, the banking regulator, uh, from, from the public development banks, the DFIs, helping you to expand your business uh, with small and medium-sized enterprises? And be short, uh, because we are running out of time. Thank you, Bruno. I think when, when I hear that uh, government is in the room or the central bank or DFIs or you know, international partners are in the room, I always uh, like to emphasize uh, education because I believe uh, if we can crack uh, the issue of having enough uh, African youth so educated, and when I say educated, I mean into technical, vocational, professional training, I think this is really a prerequisite for us uh, to start building a professional uh, MSME sector. Uh, we still need, I mean, we can talk about the digital economy and the green economy and many things, but we still, we still need some basic skills. I mean, you, you need a professional plumber, you need professional chefs. In the health sector, there are so many um, uh, technical jobs that you know, some hospitals cannot fill. And uh, as, as a matter of fact, uh, we cannot attract a foreign direct investment in these sectors because we don't have the right skills. So I, I think that there's, there's a number of partnerships that are, are needed there uh, to build these uh, educational institutions to train the youth and, and not, not necessarily university degrees, et cetera, but to, to train the, these people and give them a professional training so they can enter the job market. But beyond professional training, I, I believe uh, these uh, young people need also to get some uh, entrepreneurial skills uh, just like uh, what uh, Ife was mentioning, because we want them to be able to create their own jobs, to, to build their own uh, enterprises. And uh, as an ecosystem, of course, banks will come in if there's a supportive environment to, to know how we can finance these small businesses. Um, you know, private equity companies, you know, there's a lot we can do, but having the, the people with the right mindsets, uh, the right skills uh, to start uh, creating their own jobs. So I know we don't have much time, so I want to stop there. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Diana. So, Kola, so what do you think are, the, in your view, the two top priorities uh, that to to um, to help you to to scale up uh, much more your business? So, I think uh, first and foremost is uh, having uh, more uh, development finance institutions like EDFI willing to come in and uh, provide subordinated debt. Uh, that is a very critical piece because I think that will really unlock tremendous amounts of capital from a large network of, uh, of commercial uh, lenders. And I think uh, the role of EDFIs to be uh, more catalytic in that sense, I think, is very important. I, I commend EDFI for taking, uh, for taking that, that approach. Um, the second thing is really around um, yeah, tying into your, your question around uh, policy. I think at the end of the day, when I've seen policy change happen, it's typically happened off the back of government seeing something that works domestically, right? Because otherwise, there's always the, you know, this may not work here, or this won't work here, or so on and so forth. So if you take the case of Babangona as an example, you know, we had institutional investors that supported us in those early days to demonstrate that this idea of a hyper-focused lending institution to MSMEs uh, could create rapid scale and impact in terms of jobs. After we were able to get to a very reasonable scale within our first four years, uh, they advocated on our behalf to leading government institutions. Uh, we became, uh, ended up having uh, strong partnerships with, uh, or, uh, with uh, institutions like the Central Bank of Nigeria, who basically designed a whole agricultural program, uh, the Ankara program, off of Babangona and committed, you know, 200 billion naira towards trying to replicate and stimulate more Babangona type entities, right? And so uh, I think the next step here is really around, uh, you know, uh, 
is uh, helping the government to understand that they can, as opposed to today, where they lend directly off their own balance sheet to support organizations like us, to replicate models uh, more akin to the US farm credit system and other models in other parts of the world where they basically provide a sovereign guarantee that then in turn helps to stimulate uh, capital coming in, particularly from the, uh, from, uh, from the likes of the pension funds, domestic pension funds, and other massive capital uh, entities. Oh, many thanks. Uh, so this is uh, this is music in my ears because since many many years I'm advocating that uh, there's a need for reforms of uh, the pension system because there's a huge amount of domestic resources that is available. That and the question is how this huge amount of money can be made available for development and and, and finance development without any kind of uh, local currency risk. And uh, this is uh, I think uh, one of the issues. Uh, so I would like now to open the Q&A session and uh, there is one comment that uh, corporate governance and financial transparency are key issues to be fixed before funding a, a company. I think that's quite clear, uh, but, uh, but Jana was referring to existing companies and, uh, and they are now facing a problem also uh, in, in terms of the generation problem. There was a question, what are the, and a very good question, what are the solutions to support the informal sector, which is important in the African economies and which is on, uh, and on which the majority of the population in African countries depend? Uh, uh, so who would like uh, to have a quick uh, question, Kola? So that is fundamentally what we do. If you look at the, the, the typical uh, client we lend to, they have no formal address, they may not have a phone, they, have, they, they, have, they may not even have a government ID, right? Uh, and they have no credit history. So how do you lend to that, that group and attain a 99% credit? Uh, repayment rate. Babangona today, if you look at Babangona, if you look at Babangona today, uh, you know, where uh, being a highly specialized lender requires innovative approaches. You know, one, we have one of the largest technology teams deploying very advanced technology from artificial intelligence, uh, biometrics, facial recognition, all kinds of different things to be able to deal with these types of risks. And then coupled with uh, a massive investment in infrastructure, we have Nigeria's largest fleet of motorcycles. We have thousands of motorcycles out there visiting farmers, visiting these informal uh, uh, MSMEs. Uh, you know, we've had to invest in over 100,000 metric tons of storage capacity in these communities. So it requires both the use of technology and, uh, and uh, uh, investment in, in infrastructure to be able to reach and manage the risk within these informal uh, groups. So there is one final question that uh, SMEs activity have a great social and economic impact. At the same time, development banks are increasingly criticized when they finance directly or indirectly fossil fuel sector, for example, financing of petrol station carried by small and medium sized enterprises starting to be criticized. What do you think of this controversy and how to find the right balance between challenges of climate change with the financing of SMEs, especially in countries where the economy is dominated by fossil fuel. Maybe that, Jana, you can answer this question. Yeah, I think, I don't think there's a controversy, uh, to be honest. I think uh, uh, where the opportunities are, uh, the financial sector will follow. Uh, but again, when we look at the sustainability, we also are, and, th and I think this is also the role of government and, and other partnerships uh, to unlock the other opportunities in the economy of the future. So we talk about the digital economy, the green economy that also need uh, a, a certain regulatory framework, a technology framework that uh, is not necessarily um, existing uh, today in Africa. Uh, but for now, you know, we, we also finance uh, 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 fossil fuel energy because, you know, we need energy in this country to run uh, the manufacturing, to run um, uh, industries, etc. So, so we are looking at the next uh, level of financing, the next step, and we are looking for solutions also uh, to go into um, a sustainable economy. But for now, I think we have to, uh, I think it's absolutely important and critical uh, to finance solutions today 
that uh, supports uh, economic growth and transformation and also jobs. Thank you. Okay, Bruno, if I may add yeah. uh, just quickly on that. I think it's very important that as opposed to blacklisting investments in these areas, to be smart about how you can actually invest in these areas and actually leverage that investment to transition those industries. I think a specific example would be, for example, Babangona, by us working with these farmers, we're actually helping them to reduce their carbon footprint, right? We're helping them uh, do micro dosing to reduce the amount of fertilizer that they're using uh, more efficiently, uh, instead of cutting down trees, trimming the trees, uh, you know, not practicing slash and burn agriculture. But if you actually red, uh, if you blacklist trees, you wouldn't be able to play an active role to help to our sustainable measures. I, I could not agree more. We have uh, asked uh, Mrs. Marietta Jaga, the Deputy Director General for International Cooperation and Development at the European Commission, to tell us more about the difficult task the EU has to find the balance between its ambitious to lead a green and resilient recovery and the need to address the immediate economic and social impact of COVID-19 crisis in Africa and to explain how public development banks and DFE's response on uh, um, can help contribute into this agenda. Please start the video. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, let me first thank uh, ETFI for the invitation to address you at this important summit. I want to use this opportunity to express our appreciation for the work done by ETFI and also for the joint declaration by all uh, public development banks. A strong private sector in Africa is prerequisite for sustainable development and for a recovery out of this crisis. And therefore, the topic today cannot be more relevant and timely. The private sector in Africa has been hit particularly hard by the pandemic. Therefore, we need to address their financial needs in order to give a boost to Africa's business environment and to build back better. As you know, the EU has taken immediate step to help our partners, including in Africa, to get on the road to recovery. By acting with our member states and EU financial institutions, we have pulled together more than 37 billion euros. And also European uh, investment plan, in, together with the EFSD as its uh, financial arm, has been entirely reoriented to tackle the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. As you know, through the EFSD, we are providing 1.5 billion in financial guarantees, and uh, those guarantees uh, aim to guarantee more than 16 billion in overall investment. I'm extremely proud that in good timing for today's summit, we are uh, concluding the current EFSD, and I hope that uh, we will be having an occasion to celebrate that. Among the guarantees that we are uh, signing in the last package, I mean, we have five amounting to over uh, 520 million euros that will help small businesses uh, to stay afloat and to continue to grow in the face of the pandemic. And for example, one guarantee aims to provide access to loan and capital to start or expand businesses by reducing the risk for local uh, financial intermediaries, those uh, allowing uh, banks to loan more and with uh, better terms. But uh, more needs to be done. And for example, another one aims that uh, European uh, diaspora could uh, help uh, countries of origin by providing the investments into the small and medium enterprises. But uh, we are all aware of the consequences, social, economic and uh, uh, environmental and climate crisis on top of the health uh, uh, crisis. Uh, and uh, that all tells us that the objective of our European Green Deal is uh, uh, more relevant than ever and remain, remain intact in the COVID-19 uh, context. Basically, we should be able to take away from this pandemic an opportunity to rebuild our economies differently and to make them more resilient and more environmentally sustainable. Of course, government intervention is necessary to accelerate investment and especially the green investment, uh, basically to 
bring in the private investors by providing the guarantees to reduce risk and uh, basically to ensure uh, undistorted trade and investment conditions. But this is my main message for you, ladies and gentlemen. The development finance institution, you, you have the key role to play including in driving further the private investments and reducing perceived and actual investment risk, basically supporting green and sustainable investments and creating more transparency on financial flows and best practices. Let me conclude. Private sector and SMEs in particular, they are backbone of our economies, whether in Europe, Africa or elsewhere. As such, they are key partners our key partners, and we will continue to use uh, all our tools to promote and assist them, including through the next EFSD, where we are looking forward to closely cooperate with all IFIs, including uh, the EDFI. And by uh, turning our vision into reality, the business community, the financial institutions, and policymakers, together we can build back better Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you a very successful summit. So there was a strong commitment uh, of the European Union to Africa and especially to the private sector through guarantees, as Kola was also mentioning. Um, uh, my main takeaways from this very lively debate is finding the right finance for the youth having a systematic and holistic approach uh, from startup to IPOs, uh, the need uh, to, uh, to provide much more subordinated debt, the need for policy dialogue, so in order to get uh, a, a con an environment for the private sector that's conducive, the need to uh, provide education, good education, which includes also then entrepreneurial skills and finally also looking for sustainable solutions to finance the informal sector. With that, I would like to thank very much the panelists, Ifi, Diana and Kola for the lively debate and that, uh, that you have shared with us uh, your insights and thoughts. I'd like also to thank the colleagues behind the scene for the excellent uh, preparation and I'd like especially to thank Matilda and Law and I thank very much the, participant, the participants for joining um, the Finance in Summit, Summit today. And um, stay healthy and safe. And good luck. Many thanks for joining. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.